Philippians chapter 5, I'm going to look at the last two verses of chapter 5, and then uh, follow through with the first six verses of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 5 and verse 20, the Bible says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. I want to speak this morning on the dangers of sin in the life of a Christian. You know, physically, uh, I look around and um, there's some younger people in the uh, sanctuary this morning, but most of us are getting some age on us. Speaking to myself, you don't ever say that to a lady. But uh, you, you've come to realize that uh, your body has to be taken care of. When you were young, you didn't think that. You ate whatever you wanted, you did whatever you wanted, you kind of thought that you were invincible. But uh, now that we get some age on us, we go to the doctor and they tell me I've got uh, high cholesterol, you've got uh, high sugar, you've got high blood pressure, don't eat this, you ought to do this, and those type of things. You probably have heard some of that. Some of it I understand is hereditary. But there are diseases that uh, affect the body that you're more cognitive of now than when you were younger. And uh, they can be uh, a discomfort, but they can also be deadly to the body. And you make life choices based on that. Whenever they say that uh, you, you've got high sugar, then you, you might be able to control it, but you also say, well, I, I probably shouldn't eat certain things. Or you, you've got high blood pressure, you better take some medication for that and try to do things that are less stressful and those things. And you make a decision if you want to do that or not. Or whatever else that will pertain. Now th those are some kind of typical categories like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high sugar. And in America, you're, you're subject to that. But then there are all, there's some, you know, others that, uh, you know, you, you, you don't uh, just select cancer, of course, but it is a number one killer, and it is a disease that affects the body, and there are others. Some of these we help to bring on ourselves. Some of these are somewhat controllable. I realize that not all are, but diseases affect the body and they can be deadly. And you make a life choice, a life decision, and you do some alterations to attempt to avoid them. Sin to the spirit and also affecting the body is deadly. And you and I don't look at it that way, but uh, it is, the Bible does, and Jesus tells us that it is, and we need to go against it. And I, I'm talking about saved people. In our text, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 20, and uh, if, if my
my speech and volume is not correct, then it can be adjusted. But if you look at Romans chapter 5, verse 20, the Bible says, Moreover, the law entered. When he says the law entered, he's speaking about uh, the, the Ten Commandments. He's speaking about the whole embodiment of the truth of the Word of God that God gave to us in the Old Testament and uh, given by Moses and so forth. And it means that so that you and I can realize that we're a sinner. The law of God was brought in so that you and I could realize we broke the law. And uh, whenever the law is posted and then you break the law, you realize you're guilty. And so when the law of God was given in the Ten Commandments, it in and of itself is not one that would bring life, but it would bring you to the point to where you can see you're guilty. And that's why the Bible says in Galatians that the law is a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. The point of the law was to get you to realize that you need Jesus. And today you understand that when you deal with people and when you speak with people, that uh, you have the answer, you have the gospel message. But until they realize their need for that, then they won't get saved. As often has been said, you have to get a person lost before that they can realize they need to get saved. That's what the law did. The average individual would think that they're a pretty good person, that they're, they're a decent person. And uh, that is one of the biggest lies of the devil. And uh, they would think that uh, by doing good that they'll be, they'll be okay. And then they also point the finger at somebody else to say that they're not as bad. But that's what he means in verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might amount so that an individual would realize that they are a sinner. Now, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And praise God for that. This is the grace of God that bringeth salvation. The grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us. And the grace of God that brings salvation. So you have within those two verses the, the difference, if you will, in grace versus law. Now he says, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, and uh, sin brought death, and by as one man, that's verse uh, 12 of Romans chapter 5, Wherefore, as by one man, speaking about Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That's one of the, the verses that I believe that in the progression of creation, that it was the six literal days. I don't hold to the fact that there was something before uh, that creation. Because death came in uh, through sin, the sin of uh, Adam, uh, and I understand the devil had uh, fallen and he chose that, but uh, the Bible says that uh, sin and death, they go together. And he speaks of that in Romans 5, 12, as one man. And that's what he means in verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, and sin today still reigns unto death. And it can reign in the life of the child of God as well. And so sin brings death. You and I, as it has been illustrated before, with the obvious, and I'm not meaning to be hurtful or harmful in any way of somebody that's had a bodily infirmity. And uh, I experienced those things myself. If you understood that uh, death was over here in the pot, there's death in the pot, you would avoid that. And, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't touch cancer. You wouldn't touch uh, HIV and, and, and these types of things. You, you, wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't touch COVID. You, would, you, wouldn't get, you would avoid that if you see that. But God is trying to get you and I to see sin as exceeding sinful. That's what the Bible says. So that you and I would see sin as exceedingly sinful. 
And he says that uh, sin reigns unto death. Sin today still reigns unto death. It's easier to sin today than it ever has been before. You used to, you know, it would have to be kind of a, a you know, a, a public matter. It's piped into the home now. And uh, I believe that the psalmist said they wouldn't see a wicked thing before his eyes. But it's piped into the privacy of the home now. It gets a lot of people in trouble. And uh, with all forms of addiction, and it reigns unto death. He says, even so my grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So you have the differentiation right there between uh, law and grace. Law is to point you to the fact that you need a Savior. Law is to point to the fact that sin is exceeding sinful. Now, law allows you and I to understand what God thinks about sin. And the picture of what God thinks about sin is his son on the cross. Lord Jesus hanging on the cross and his father turning his back on him because he had the sins of the world placed on him. And that sin was my sin and your sin and the sins of the whole world. Now as you go into chapter 6, the Bible says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The argument that may be stated here, and I have uh, commented on the, uh, the early immature life of myself as a Christian. I got saved at the age of eight, understanding uh, my lost condition and uh, understanding that the penalty was hell and I didn't want to go to hell. And so it was a message on hell that led to my salvation. And then uh, there was an experience at the age of 12 of uh, accepting a of a baptism. I'm saying the Lord worked on my heart as a young person, but if that young person is not uh, dealt with and formed uh, through the steady diet of the Word of God and those that are around them, it's very difficult to keep a young person in the direction they should be going. And I've stated that and you've seen it. There is something phenomenal that happens in the life of a teenager. And uh, you, I was, you know, bright enough in the flesh to understand that I was saved by grace through faith, kept by the power of God, sealed to the day of redemption, and that I couldn't get lost. When an individual accepts that part of it, hey, praise God for that. When an individual takes advantage of that part of it, He's heading for disaster. That's what verse 1 means. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, the individual knows that they're saved by grace through faith, kept by the power of God. They're not going to lose their salvation. Can they go ahead and play in sin? Can they go ahead and dabble in sin? That's what he's talking about. And that's, that's what a lot of individuals do. Young, old, and in between. You got enough Bible theology to know that you ain't going to hell because you're saved by the grace of God and everybody's doing it anyway. And nobody's perfect. So they dabble in something that they ought not be dabbling in. And if you would equate it to the fact that uh, over here is something that's going to have a detrimental effect to the body, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't do that. And you, you have to cut it off. Sometimes it has to get bad enough to where you say, I'm not, I'm not touching that. And that's where the Lord would have us to understand the detrimental effect of sin in the life of the child of God. So he goes on to say, would you continue in sin knowing that you're saved? Sealed into the day of redemption, would you play, dabble in, in sin? He says, God forbid. Now, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? This is where the depth of it gets, and he's speaking about the old man versus the new man. And the old man versus the new man here in verse 6 is saying this, watch this, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. And he's speaking about the old sin nature. 
that when you got saved, I understand that you didn't have the whole breadth of theology the moment that you got saved. The moment that you got saved, you heard the gospel of your salvation, and you realized that you were a sinner. Jesus is the Savior, and by childlike faith, you accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And the Bible even says that we are then as newborn babes. But as a newborn babe, there ought to be some semblance to that. And one of those is the desire for the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. And he, he's making the analogy that as a newborn babe, that would be in the natural sense, would desire uh, nurturing, would desire nursing, would desire milk that they would grow thereby. The same would be true for a child of God. There is a flag when a child of God gets saved and you absolutely see no evidence of that in their life. And by their fruit, you know them. And so everybody could sit and pick apart what that looks like. I'm just saying, uh, you understand this, that there are people who have made a profession of faith in Christ and you don't see evidence of it. And it, it ought to be a danger to them and a flag to you and so forth. He says, knowing this, verse 6, that our old man is crucified with him. He's speaking about the old flesh nature, the sin nature. This is speaking about the substitutionary death that when, when, when Christ died on the cross, you accepting Christ as your personal Lord and Savior is you crucifying the flesh, you dying to the old sin nature. You hold your spot right there for a moment and look at Ephesians chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And in verse 22, the Bible says that you put off concerning the former conversation, that means your life, lifestyle, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Those are the things of, of the old man, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life that pertains to the natural man. And the devil capitalizes on every one of those things. He allows you to see things and, and to want them. And uh, the lust of the flesh, you desire in the flesh, and I'm going to, to get it doctor says you probably ought not eat that because it's going to, to hurt and harm you and you say I know that but I want it and I'm going to get it and it is in that old sin nature that the Bible says you ought not look at that you ought not go there you ought not say that you ought not do that and the flesh says I know but I'm going to anyway and then they're, they're heading in the wrong path and he says you have to put that off these are things that, um, yeah, you got saved. When you got, ex when you got saved by the grace of God, you, you gained heaven, you escaped hell. Praise God for that. But this is the life afterward, and it's what you have to involve yourself in. He says sin is going to hurt you. Sin is going to hurt you. It has ramifications. And he says you're going to have to put off that old former conversation, that the old man, he calls it which is corrupt according to the deceitful us. What did Paul say? In my flesh dwelleth what? No good thing. No good thing. And we fight that. And we like to search around and say, well, there, there's some good thing. No, there's no good thing. You and I have to accept that fact. And I, I'm not saying that you think so lowly of yourself that you uh, count yourself worthless. Absolutely not. You're worth everything to God. By the grace of God, he loved you, he died for you. But I'm saying that you and I don't get puffed up and elevated to think there's something good in the flesh. There's no good thing. The only good thing in you is now the Holy Spirit of God is in you. Amen. All by the grace of God. And it's really the only power that you have to put off these former conversations of old, old, the old man. Now, in verse 23, he says... And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Watch it in verse 24. And that you put on the new man. 
which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. This is only possible through the indwelling Holy Spirit of God, who you received at the moment that you got saved. When you got saved, you were sealed until the day of redemption. You received the Holy Spirit of God. And so the only way that you can put off the old man and to put on the new man is through the direction, the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. And in verse 6 of our text this morning, Romans chapter 6 and in verse 6, he's speaking and there's the connection to that verse that we looked up in Ephesians chapter 4. He said, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. If the old man is crucified with him, then you and I ought not allow him to be resurrected. And the old man wants to resurrect. All, uh, every day, every day, the old man wants to resurrect. And the devil's going to lay snares for you, lay traps for you to get the old man resurrected. And he, he'll, he'll do it in a multitude of ways. The Bible says in Hebrews that uh, you lay aside the weight that does, you know, so easily, the sin weight that does so easily beset you. And so... Uh, Individuals are complex. We understand that. Very complex. You were the, the crowning creation in the creation. After he made everything else, let us make man in our image. Male and female created he them. And so, very complex. And every individual is complex. But here's the thing. Because we have a sin nature, everybody has also a besetting sin. There, there, is a, there is a common sin. It's lust of the eyes, lust of the uh, pride of life, lust of the flesh, pride of life. And that's the way that the devil tempted the Lord Jesus in those areas. But everybody has a besetting sin. And an individual would say, I, I would never be tempted by that. I, I, I wouldn't fall. How, how would they fall to that? But then you have one. And the devil cannot read your mind. God knows your mind. God knows your very thoughts. The devil doesn't, but he knows your actions. And he knows people. And the way that he attacks you doesn't have to change because it always works. And so it is likened to, as the preacher would say, that the one that liked to go bass fishing, certain lure is going to get it. And it may not, may not hit on every other lure, and then all of a sudden you use the right lure, and out comes that bass and he's got him. And that's the way the devil works. And so an individual should never get caught up and say, well, I'd never, I'd never do that. And you have to be careful, because there's a besetting sin, and uh, it, it, uh, it, it gets you. Well, you see this old man versus the new man, but you, you notice this as well, if you, you hold your spot in Romans chapter 6, look at John 8, 44. John 8, 44. And when you get to John 8, 44, I want you to hold that. Look at Acts 13, 10 as well. Acts 13, 10. John in chapter 8, verse 44. The Lord Jesus is having a dialogue with a group of people, and he's speaking the truth, but they are ignoring it or not hearing it. They, they may hear it physically, but it's not making any difference spiritually at the moment. In John 8, 44, the Bible says, Ye are of your father, the devil. Now that's the Lord Jesus speaking and, and, and preaching. So that probably wouldn't go over real well in the congregation if he said, you're your father, the devil. But it speaks of the truth here that, that people are saved or not saved. They are in their original state, old man, or they have the new nature. They are of 
their father, the devil, corrupt, or they are of their father, the Lord Jesus. Now see, he says, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, you will do. The, the lost person does what the lost person does because their father is the devil. And every person that is born comes in as a lost person. If they die before the age of accountability, praise God, they go to heaven. The blood of Christ covers that. If they reach the age of accountability, they have to make a choice. For him to know it, to do good, and do it, but not to him it is sin. And so when they reach the age of accountability, they, they have to get saved. Now, he says that uh, they, they will do the lust of the Father. They'll do that. So they do what they do because their father's the devil. Now, you're probably thinking in your mind right now, I know some lost people that are just wonderful people. And so it, there are uh, nice lost people and there are mean lost people. But they still do the lusts of their father, the devil. The main lust that they do of the father, their devil, is rejection of Christ. That's the main one. They can be motivated by money. They can be motivated by uh, sins of the flesh. They can have multiple motivations. But the main problem is the rejection of Christ. They can be so high and haughty, they don't think that they need Jesus. They think you need Jesus, but they don't need Jesus. But it is the rejection of Christ. He says this, he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not of the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is the liar and the father of it. And so you see here that the Lord Jesus says a group of people are motivated by their father, the devil. In Acts chapter 13, and in verse 10, you have the same uh, concept. The Apostle Paul is speaking, preaching, witnessing to an individual, Elias the sorcerer. And he says in verse 10, it said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Here is an individual, Elias the sorcerer, that had been held in high regard in the locale, in the locality. But when he was addressed with the truth, the Apostle Paul speaks to him and tells him that he's full of subtlety and mischief, wrongdoing. He's subtle, he's slick, and probably was versed. But he's subtle, and he's full of mischief, and he said he's a child of the devil, and is the enemy of righteousness. And so you see, Satan's child versus God's child. If you look back in our text in uh, Romans chapter 6, in verse 4 is where I pulled the thought, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, Romans 6, 4. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. The Father, he's speaking about God the Father. And it becomes your heavenly Father the moment that you get saved. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. In uh, verses 3 and 5, you have this thought of dying versus living. In 3, the Bible says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. When he's speaking about baptized into Jesus, baptism carries with it a couple of thoughts. One is identification. And as the text would go about that they were baptized into Moses at the Red Sea, it was an identification. Those Jews were identified with Moses as the leader. Now, as type and typology would go, Moses would have been uh, a, a savior to bring them out, if you will, through the Passover. It's just typology. I'm not saying he's matched to Jesus. I'm saying he led the people out of Egypt, which is out of the world as a picture. And in typology, he was the leader that led them out, led them over to the Red Sea, was used of the Lord to be able to part the Red Sea. The power of God did it, instructing uh, Moses and the Red Sea.
the sea parted, and they went over on dry ground, and the people went after him. And then the enemy is saying to go, they were buried in that. But the Bible speaks that they were identified with Moses. If you were identified with Moses and followed Moses, you were going through. It was a difficult time. There was difficulties. There was murmuring. There was griping. There was complaining. But uh, they were identified with Moses, and he, he got them to the other side. He took him up to uh, Canaan land. Joshua took them in. But uh, here, when he says that you were baptized into Jesus Christ, he's speaking about when you got saved. When you got saved, you were placed in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're safe in Christ. He's a picture of the ark. You're safe in Christ. You were placed in Christ Jesus. The Bible verse most commonly used for that is, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. So you're placed in Christ when you got saved. That's a theological truth. You're, you're in Christ, and Christ is in you. But he's also speaking about the fact, and that's an identification, that there is this planting of baptism that is an outward manifestation of that inward work of grace that when an individual gets saved, they should follow through with believer's baptism. It's certainly not the water that puts you in Christ or that gets you saved. You're saved by the blood. Amen. But water baptism is the first step of obedience and it is a picture of the gospel so that when you go under the water and it's a picture of death you're rising to newness of life in Christ that you should walk therein and so that's what he's speaking about you get saved you're in Christ when you get baptized yes it's joining the local church and it's a picture of the gospel is what he's saying and he says that in verse 6 that uh, knowing this that the old man is crucified with him now I'm speaking this morning, and uh, th this won't be finished today. I understand that it's an, it's an ongoing lesson, but I'm speaking this morning about the dangers of sin in the life of a Christian. The dangers of sin in the life of a Christian. Uh, tonight, this local church will observe the Lord's Supper, and uh, every member should be present. And it is, it's a solemn event, and uh, you are to partake of it as often as you do this. You, it's a memorial service, and Christians ought to partake. They ought to be here. Uh, visitors are welcome to hear the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, but the membership partakes of the Lord's Supper. And it is a memorial of what Christ did. And it is a recognition. There is a time of examination. Remember that uh, they said, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? When the Lord Jesus spoke to them that night and said, as he looked around and said, one of you will betray me this evening. And they said, Lord, is it I? And the, the lesson there is simply for you and I to say, you know, the Lord has got that in there then how does that apply to me? It applies to every one of us within the realm of sin, within the realm of a besetting sin, to say, what would it take that I would betray Jesus? And some would say, I absolutely love Jesus. I, I would never, like Peter, though, 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 though everyone would betray him, yet not I. And Jesus would say, in paraphrase now, Peter, In his case, it happened right away. You know, a lot of times we read the passages, we read the scriptures, and we get that, but sometimes it's later on down the road. And we wind up in left field, we have betrayed Jesus, and then later on we read that verse and it's like, what happened? It's because of the dangers of sin in the life of a Christian. So, I've only really got started, but I'm going to leave us with a few thoughts and a few moments that I, that I have left. I want you to look at uh, Psalm 101. Psalm 101. In 
Psalm 101 and in verse 3, I have us look at this to make the point. Be careful of what you see. Psalm 101, verse 3, the Bible says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Now, in your King James Bible, who is that a psalm written by? David. 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 David was a man after God's own heart. And David was. He, he was the most spiritual man in, in the Bible. Did any wicked thing get set before his eyes and like a trap? Okay. All right. Now, the individual was probably not, not wicked, although I, I've instructed uh, ladies, it, it, it's good to keep your clothes on in public. You say, well, dirty old man shouldn't look. Ladies, you ought to keep your clothes on in public. It'll help everybody. Probably shouldn't be out uh, bathing. It's my backyard. Probably shouldn't do that. Probably help everybody if you didn't. But it, it, it's not addressing the fact that you necessarily, well, she was wicked. Yeah, but he had already known, set no wicked thing before my eyes. Let me ask you this. If everybody, you know, has a besetting sin, and uh, we're all human and all that thing, uh, and I know that they had more than one wife back in that time, but it was not the perfect plan of God from the beginning. Not the perfect plan of God from the beginning. When you go through your wedding vows, there is the leaving and cleaving, and there was a husband and a wife, and therefore shall man leave his mother and father, and they shall be one. And so I understood it was permitted, but it was not promoted. <coughs> And it was not the intention. But as you read about David, did he have multiple wives? David had multiple wives. Okay. Uh, did that probably trickle over into his son Solomon's life? I mean, help me out. All right. So David here, and we could say, well, you know, David, see, you, you wasn't where you're supposed to be, and he wasn't. Wasn't seeing what he sh should have looked at, should have turned his head. But he said right here, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside and shall not cleave to me. Would you attempt to own that and say, I'm made of the same kind of flesh, and there is the possibility that what I see could have a negative effect on me? What, what are we seeing to the little kids? Be careful, little eyes, what you see. So how many of us say, and read the verse, but then it's still... There's a negative effect. Now, the devil knows that, and it's promoted all around you. I understand. It's promoted all around you. But there was licentious behavior even back then. It, it, it's more available today. So uh, be careful what you see. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Talking about the dangers of sin in the life of the Christian. Matthew chapter 12. In verse 35 and 36, be careful what you say. Matthew chapter 12, verse 35. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bring forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bring forth evil things. Watch it, verse 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Boy, I've got some repenting to do. If you be honest, you do too. Every idle word, that means those that don't help, they hinder. Those that mean they don't bless, they curse. And I don't necessarily just mean a cuss word. Hopefully we don't get caught up in that, but it means it's it's not helpful, it's hurtful. And it is in a, in a moment of the flesh, of course. James 3, 5 goes on to say, even so the tongue is a little member and boasts of great 
fiends, behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth through the tongue. Be careful of what you say. Here's another one. Go to Isaiah 31. I don't know how many people quote this and me first. Isaiah 31. These are things that uh, you may not do and then in a certain circumstance be guilty of. I believe David meant it with his whole heart when he wrote that song. But then I believe that something took place and got caught up in it. And I believe that Peter meant, Lord, I'll never betray you. But it quickly happened to give you and I an indication. And I, I believe that uh, this pertains to us. And we may say, I would never do that, never go back. But you have to remember the verse and be guarded against it. Be careful where you go. I said, be careful what you see. Don't say any wicked thing before your eyes. Be careful what you say. Every idle word you'll give an account for of in the day of judgment for Christians at the Bema seat. Be careful where you go. In Isaiah 31, 1, the Bible says, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust to chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. This is an individual that says, I've been praying, 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 and I'm not getting any help, so I'm going to the world. And they, they, they may not say it like that bluntly, but they get to saying, you know, I, I've read my Bible and, and, and done what the Bible says, and I've been faithful to church and these types of things, and, and this isn't working for me, so I'm, I'm going to go back to the world a little bit. I'll keep a foot in the, in the church, but I'm going to seek the world for other things. And throughout the Word of God, there are examples of where God was not pleased with that and an immediate judgment happened. Moreover, in our day of grace, it's more long-term usually that the negative effect comes and you'll see it in your life and then in the life of those that uh, are around you. I'm out of time. I'll look at one more. Uh, James 4, 17. Be careful what you do. I said these are the dangers of sin in life for the, the Christian. Be careful what you see. Be careful what you say. Be careful where you go. James 4.17, of course, says be careful what you do. James 4.17. In James chapter 4 and in verse 17... The Bible says, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And I've told you, I, I used to kind of scratch my head a little bit about that, that well, it, it's sin to everybody, but it means it's laid to your account. It's laid to your account. I'll get more into next week of when we talk about that your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, and they are, but I want to dive into that a little bit more. And I will talk about that next week. But as a child of God, be careful what you see. It's all around you. Be careful what you say. Be careful where you go. And be careful of what you do. Lord, be our helper. Helper, Lord. We can do that through the Holy Spirit of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the word of God, the truth that is contained therein. Help us, dear Lord, to put off the old man, put on the new man after righteousness in the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us in the service that follows. Please bring people safe to church. And if somebody comes in lost, that they would get saved and the saint would be encouraged. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake.